I honored to introduce our two speakers tonight. We have two, can you watch for the admit just in case? Um, we have two respiratory therapists with a great deal of experience. So Don Davidson has been a respiratory therapist for 35 years, working in various positions. He spent extensive time working with the CF population from infants through adults. And he said he very much enjoys the challenges and rewards of working with and helping CF patients. And he served as CF coordinator and educator in the past and is currently working at Duke Medical Center where he does pulmonary function studies and helps coordinate with the adult CF population. And he, is, he said it's a privilege to be able to continue help the CF community here at Duke. And then Kathy Mealy, who's been a respiratory therapist for almost 40 years, and she's worked with CF patients during most of her career. She said she's learned a lot over the years from patients, families, and coworkers, and it's been fascinating to see how treatments and medications have evolved, evolved over time. She's been involved in several research studies that have focused on the CF population and airway clearance treatments. And she also currently works at Duke in the adult pulmonary lab where she does perform lung function testing and education with the CF, adult CF population. So, uh, Without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to them and we'll get started. They have a lot to go over tonight. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Uh, like I said, I appreciate your introduction. Uh, I, uh, I'm, I'm privileged and uh, I'm honored to get to talk to you for a bit. Uh, one of the problems we, we have is we don't have enough time. But uh, I'd <clears throat> like to go ahead and, you know, give you guys some background of some of the therapeutics that are out there and we'll break this down into some some pieces if you will um, so the first thing to talk about when it comes right down to it is at what point do we start thinking about doing therapy as soon as you get a diagnosis that's that is really when the therapies are starting to be utilized and we start with you know, newborns in the most time we find out that they have a positive cf then we, we start thinking about how do we start working with this? And right out, of the, right out of the gate, we start with CPT, chest physiotherapy. A lot of times we'll teach the parents, you know, if you've probably seen those cups, the rubber cups, we use those. And we basically start them with that. And we do that a couple of times a day. And over time, we continue to just build on our therapies. And what's really fascinating to me is when I started doing this 35 years ago, uh, there wasn't too much out there. I mean, basically the whole idea was uh, with CPT was 12 positions as they got older and the treatments would take upwards of 45 minutes. And as they turned, get headed towards adulthood, there were very vigorous treatments and it required definitely a lot of positions. We didn't have a lot of the medications that we have now. So over time, we've seen this just giant evolution of change and it's it's been really wonderful to watch. and. Each one of these things, these therapies, has helped improve outcomes. Um, uh, and now, of course, as a lot of you are aware, uh, keep up with things in the CF world, um, our protein modulators, Trikafta being the kind of the newest one, is showing amazing, promising results. So it's nice to, over my career, I've watched the spectrum of, of therapies. And so what I wanna first talk about is I want to talk about um, active cycle of breathing techniques, and I want to talk about huff coughing and thoracic expansion exercises. The reason I open with this is because once you have taught the patient how to do these therapies, they can have them for the rest of their lives, no matter what. If the vest isn't working or they're on a vacation or they're driving down the road in the car, they can apply these therapies. Now, the active cycle of breathing technique is really quite simple there is the concept of breathing correctly first off and you know regular breathing is fine and we're all used to it the active cycle of breathing is quite a bit different um the first thing we learn we teach our patients to do is to breathe with their diaphragms we call it belly breathing and we start learning how to do that and that's not an easy thing to do initially but once they get used to it they start breathing easier they start breathing deeper so those are important things to have. It's also a good technique to use for recovery after you've gone through coughing. So belly breathing is a good thing to learn how to do. Then the, the, to couple that with a couple other things, we do what's called a T, a thoracic expansion exercise. And that's simply 
taking a deep breath and holding it. And I'm just holding it right now. And while that's happening, the air is in my lungs. And what it's doing is it's moving through collaterals in my airways. And people don't think about it, but there are many collaterals in your airways. Two prominent ones would be pores of cone and canals of Lambert. They're in there. And what you want to do is try to get airflow to go up underneath and under the smaller ways to get behind the secretions. And then you can start moving those secretions up the pulmonary escalator and eventually expectorate or cough it out. Coughing is a very important technique as well. And a lot of us think that coughing, and I'll demonstrate this, is simply, <coughs> and you cough and you clear it. With CF, it's quite a bit different because as we're all aware, the secretions are viscous, they're thick, and they don't just come on out, they're sticky. So again, getting a proper cough can be extremely helpful. And I'm gonna show you a couple of different types of coughs. We call them huff coughs, and you may have heard of these or know about them. If not, a huff cough is basically using the open mouth technique. And what it does is it allows those secretions to be pulled, slowly pushed up. And then you can expectorate. So let me cough real quick. <coughs> now, did you hear how that just stopped? If you have secretions that are down there, those secretions are going to just stay right there. Let me demonstrate a huff cough. Now, this huff cough is what we call a low huff cough, okay? And I'll demonstrate this for you. Do you hear the difference? Basically, what you see here is not so much force, but a movement of air in bulk up the airways. I'll do one more. That's what we call a low huff cough. Now, a high huff cough is when you've gotten it up a little further. And it is much more forceful, but again, open mouth technique. Let me show you real quick. <coughs> now the secretions have had a chance to get up here in the large areas or even the trachea. Now, <coughs> and out it comes. A lot of times after you've done vest therapy, we'll get to that in a minute. It's good to stop your cycle and do a series of these T's and huff cough. Then recover with some belly breaths, then move into your next cycle and so on and so forth where you're doing a total of four cycles of therapy. And that ends up working out very nicely. It's a lot more active than you might think. And as kids get older, especially sometimes it can be more time consuming than they, they would like, but ultimately it's a better form of therapy. Uh, one of the things that always bothers me about the vest, I think it's a wonderful device, is sometimes people will get on a vest, they shake, they do their breathing treatments, and they're done. They get off. They don't do any of these other things. So I think it's really important to incorporate those other therapies, which are the basic therapy of therapies, is your active cycle breathing technique. So I would encourage your patients, uh, your kids, to do those things. Now let's go into the vest for a second. The vest is a really wonderful device. It works very well. Um, it's an electronic controlled pneumatic powered device and it oscillates the chest wall. And it has basically the ability to um, use a lot of different types of settings. It, you, you have your Hertz, which is basically how fast is the oscillatory signal going? The power is how strong is that signal? And then you have your time, how long do you do it for? And we have a slide here, if I can get Kathy to help me pull it up. If not, I'll just talk about it. You should be able to share your screen on the bottom. Yeah, I've got it, but let's see if I can get where it is. Huh. We need an IT person here tonight, <laughs> which we don't have. I'll tell you what I'll do. Let's for sake of time. Let me just, I'll explain it. Um, so basically vest settings. Here's what's really nice. First off, let's backtrack just a tiny bit. When the vest first came out, it was for, for bigger kids. You know, we had the jacket and you put it on and you did your therapies. Well, we have baby vests now. 
we have little wraps that you can use on, you know, on babies, as long as, you know, they're not too little. But so we can start setting them up on very low settings a couple of times a day. And it does two things. One, it works very well. And two, it starts introducing them and getting them used to the idea of this therapy. So as they get older, obviously they get into a bigger wrap or a jacket. And here's what recommendations are as a general rule. Now there is always going to be some variation. So I want you to be aware of that. As you know, patients are a little different. There's different issues with certain patients versus others. And, uh, but as a general rule, uh, we like our frequency, which is that hurts. We like that to be set between 10, 12 and 14. Okay, somewhere in there. Now, if you're doing the five minute cycle method, which is the method I've kind of used everywhere I've gone. And you, you can vary this, of course. Uh, you start your frequency at 10 Hertz and your power setting should be somewhere around four to six. Don't make it too strong because one, it's, it, it's gonna definitely increase the thump, so to speak. And it can actually cause some patients some discomfort uh, to the point where they don't wanna do it. So that's, that's again, compliance is important with this. So start at 10, power setting is somewhere around four to six. Go five minutes. And while you're doing that, you can actually be doing your inhaled medication therapy. Um, let me tell you real quick about what order of therapies that you should be using. This is important. So I want you to start off with a bronchodilator. Now you can either, it can be an, either an inhaled bronchodilator like albuterol, venolin, Zopinex. Uh, and uh, I would highly encourage using a spacer that's available. You get much more deposition that way or you can actually do an albuterol nebulized medication. That's fine, a bronchodilator. And then if you're using hypertonic saline, hypercell, either like a three to 7% solution, then you can go ahead and use that next. Do not mix all these together. And then the next medication, if you were to say you'd be using Pulmazine, that would be your next medication. One thing you don't want to do is mix your pulmazyme and your hypertonic up. So you don't want to give them pulmazyme first, for instance, and then give them uh, hypertonic because basically the hypertonic will go in there and basically um, kind of denature your pulmazyme. So make sure you start off first with your hypertonic, then your pulmazyme, and then go ahead and you get your cycle do your active cycle of breathing, like I discussed, go up to your next setting. Maybe it's 11 Hertz for another five minutes. And you basically go that route and then go ahead and start um, your antibiotic. If you're taking an antibiotic, if you're taking an inhaled antibiotic, such as Toby or Clistin or Genomycin, one of those types, uh, and take that next, do another cycle, active cycle of breathing, go to your next setting, which would be now say 12 Hertz. And then after you do that, another active cycle of breathing, and then you can go ahead and finish up with your inhaled steroid, whether it's an inhaler like Flovent or a discus or a dry powder like Advair or Symbacort. Um, it could be um, a Flovent type inhaler, you know? And again, if you're using those inhaled ones, it's really good to use a spacer. If they're not, if they're dry powder, that's different. But if it's an inhaled medication like Flovent, for instance, it's not, it's basically it's propellant. Use a spacer if you're able to, it really does make a difference. So that's kind of what you would like to do with your settings on, in your review. And then you will find a lot of times, you won't be surprised at all if 20, 30, maybe even an hour later, they start coughing up stuff. If that happens, one, the medication's doing its job. And two, that active cycle of breathing has helped move that stuff up. So a lot of times after you're done with that, Keep in mind, you could have a situation where all of a sudden they're coughing a bunch of secretions up. That's exactly what you want, okay? So if they're starting to do that, go ahead and do a few more hot coughs and that'd be very helpful with that. Um, so then a couple other things with the vests. The vests have done a lot of evolvement. And uh, just as a quick side note with them, you know, you're probably all aware now that we have some vests that are mobile, that you don't have to just sit in the chair, or, uh, you know, and you can actually put them on and be doing things. Uh, you, can, you know, 
be outside walking your dog. You can be doing, we have a lady who does hers while she's doing the dishes, it's just awesome. And uh, so the bottom line is there are those vests out there. Now keep in mind, there's a couple different brands and I'm not gonna go into all of the brands, but I will say this, one brand, you wanna be really more in the 15 year old range when you start using it. And that is because it weighs up to 13 pounds, pretty heavy. The other brand out there is for use in, they say, not restricted age. I still say probably more like toddler on up to adults. Um, that vest weighs only five pounds and up to eight pounds, depending on how big the jacket is. So the advantage with this is obviously you have uh, freedom of movement, which for some patients can be very, very helpful. The disadvantage is weight when it comes right down to it and the fact that it has a battery charger. So there's that. Now the disadvantage of the electric plug-in device is obvious, it's not as mobile and it requires an electric source. So um, those are the two things about the vest that are, that are kind of nice. Now, the other thing about the vest that's critical is making sure that your jacket is correct size. So when you go to order this machine, your physician will go through the ordering process. It's important to have your sizing correct because it won't work properly without it. So make sure that the jacket size or the, the, the vest that goes around the wrap is the right size, that's important. And there's people out there that can help you get that accomplished, okay? Um, let's see, real quick here. And the next thing I wanna chat about real quick here is, is um, there's a lot of flutter devices out there. And the first question is, are they any good? Yes, they are, they're really good. And there's a lot of them. It's funny, when they first came out, I'm not as big a fan of the original Flutter that had the steel ball and like a steel ball inside of encased plastic housing. If anybody ever tried it, it's, I mean, it takes a lot to get that thing to move. So for younger patients, it just, it wasn't really a good way to go. Now, when the acapella came out, one, they were really smart. They have two different ones. They have one that's the blue one for pediatrics. And then the green one called the green pickle. You may have heard of that. That device basically is for different age groups and it works really well. It's a great device, except for one thing. You can't do nebulized treatments through it very easily. You can modify it, but that's its only disadvantage. But again, all these devices have one really great advantage. They're portable. You're not gonna take a vest with you on an airplane or on a cruise ship, but you can take an acapella, you can take an aerobica, you can take another type, there's a few of them out there. In fact, what I'm gonna do in a second here is demonstrate one that I just found that I really like. And the other thing about a lot of these devices, you can use nebulizers through them. Here's the thing though, again, just like the vest, any other high frequency wall, I think it's really important that you go ahead and use that active cycle of breathing and, you, and do those techniques after you're doing, get it into a cycle. My recommended cycle as tolerated would be 10 to 15 breaths and then go ahead and do your active cycle breathing, recover, do another cycle and do a total of four to five of those cycles as tolerated. Let me show you this real quick. This, this, will, uh, this makes a bit of a noise. This, is, um, this one happens to be called a vibro-pet. And you see it's, it's kind of like that. And you just breathe, you know, I'll show you here. Okay, nice breath in, full breath, expansion, and then. You can feel the vibrations yeah, on his chest. You really can. I can really whenever, feel this. Whenever he uses that. One yeah. other important thing about these devices is making sure you get the right resistance setting. You want to start off kind of low and work your way up to more resistance. Your patient, your child, or your adult, they'll feel it. They'll get to feel where it feels comfortable. The only disadvantage to this when it comes right down to it is, is honestly a somewhat technique. If they go... That means nothing. If you're not blowing it or you're blowing it through your nose at the same time, nowhere near as effective. So it needs to be something that's coached 
and kind of put into place. And once they learn how to do this, a lot of patients really like these devices. They work really well. Um, there's other times that you would like to use these devices. Say you have a patient that, well, we had a patient today that had a broken rib. So oh. Vest is kind of out for her. She's still using this until her rib heals up. So it's a nice adjunct therapy that you can take with you um, anywhere. And, and the price point is pretty good too. These will last upwards of a year. And they've got, uh, they have really nice instructions for cleaning. So and this works really nicely. I like these a lot. Um, I think, I'm trying to think if there's anything else right now, because I'm running low on time. That's what happened. Um, okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and let Kathy talk to you folks about some cleaning techniques. And, uh, and then we'll finish up by talking a little bit of kind of what you do with trikaftic, which we'll, we'll get to. So Kathy, go ahead and okay, uh, you can take I'm gonna, over. I'm gonna try try to share again, but I think probably most of you all know um, most of the cleaning techniques because they're so well listed on the CF Foundation website. So, but I just want to express how important the cleaning is for for all of our patients. I mean, it, you don't want these patients, you don't want these, these kids breathing stuff that has germs and things on it. So, so we are instructing all of our patients after every treatment to disinfect the nebulizer. And uh, we usually here, we recommend the, the hot methods um, and um, we have, have patients rinse them out with dishwashing soap and water and then disinfect them with um, either our, our thing that we think is so cool here are these microwave bags. If you have a microwave, you can put, they're, the, they're breastfeeding bags. You can put all your, your um, pieces of equipment in here with some water and steam them. So you just have to be very careful with removing um, the amount of the microwave and the hot water. So they're, they're pretty convenient with our, our patients um, that have used them. We also like the boiling for five minutes, like a soft rolling boil or just a regular baby bottle sterilizer. And there's some cold methods too with isopropyl alcohol and uh, hydrogen peroxide. I think um, most of you all know those, but um, you always wanna rinse, rinse your equipment well, um, especially if you do the cold method with sterile water. So don't use tap water, don't use distilled water. Distilled water can have a Burkholderia cepacea in it. A bacteria, so you want to make sure you're you're using the uh, sterile water. So, and um, trying to think if I have anything else, um, John. Um, just uh, uh, when you're using those Medela steam bags, um, uh, you can get up to uh, 20 uses out of one of those bags, and they come in packs of five. You can get them at Walmart, CVS, pharmacy, wherever. Um, pretty inexpensive. Again, they work really well if it's a traveling type thing where say you're gonna be somewhere where you're near a microwave, you can use them in your equipment. Uh, one other recommendation is well, make sure you clean your equipment at least once a day or have the ability to change your equipment over so you have right. something clean every day. Yeah, uh, It's a real problem, uh, people inhaling those medications. And the other part that's making sure that happens is that they're air dried really well. Yes. If they have moisture condensation droplets left over, uh, then that can just grow, uh, be a growth medium. Uh, so and, um, yeah, yeah, put them on a paper towel, get them really dry, and then store them in a plastic bag. And you, you know, you can use your dishwasher. But yeah. Make sure that the temp on that is really hot. It needs to be close to 185 degrees, which a lot of them are now. And I know a lot of people say they wouldn't do that, but it's good to kind of let people know not to use the dishwasher 
or anything other than just cleaning that. Uh, people will put them in with the dishes. No, <laughs> uh, that's want something that's you know you kind of want them avoid. And uh, when you have nebulizers, there's my side street. And while he's doing that, while you're, and like John said, when you have extra equipment, make sure you keep it clean. Like if you run in um, nebulizers to different pet valves and everything, you've got to yeah. really, really follow up with the cleaning. So. Absolutely. Um, then, you know, like your side stream nebulizers, this is a Phillips, but there's you know, the Perry Neps, which is a very popular one. If you run uh, hypersal through those, Make sure you give them a good rinse with sterile water. Make sure they get really clean. Um, this particular one, if you can kind of see, oops, this is, there it is. There. Um, there's a jet inside of these. Now the perineb, you can see it. It's a clear like little V shape, you know, a little cone almost. That, that hypersal will condensate in the salt. And so if it's not rinsed out, eventually at some point, it will plug your jets it'll plug it up and you won't have nearly as effective nebulization with it. So it's important to keep that really clean. The other thing too, is we come across this a fair amount, um, more with adult patients, to be honest with you, that uh, they kind of hang on to their equipment. And the life expectancy of some of these devices is really not as high as you might think. I mean, six months is good for a Perineb or a, or a Phillips side stream, and then you need to get them replaced. Uh, because their, their efficacy starts to decay on you mm -hmm. and they just don't nebulize as well. Um, and these, a lot of these flutter devices are good for, actually can be good for a year, no problem, as long as you keep them clean. And uh, you know, don't let the dog get a hold of it. The, yeah, the life expectancy that. goes down. <laughs> I've, I've actually heard this happen. It oh, looks yeah. just like a chew toy. Uh, so um, yeah. I'm sure my dog would love this. Oh yeah. Uh, expensive chew toy. Uh, so, um, but yeah, just, you know, equipment cleaning is just as important as anything else that we do. Uh, did you have anything else on your? I can't think so. I think oh, it. there is one other thing. I'm sorry. Uh, there are some patients that uh, use the baby bottle sterilizers, and that's perfectly great. That oh, works yeah. really well. So we can use, use those as well. Just follow your instructions yeah. on how to clean with those. And the, the yeah, the nebs with metal in them. You yeah, know, don't put those don't, in the, put those in the microwave. <laughs> it doesn't work. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but okay. <laughs> I want to talk. Just uh, the reason I'm laughing is because we actually had that happen, and <laughs> the patient was kind of mad at me. And I said, "Did you put the little metal parts in there?" And they said, "Oh, that's why it flamed up." I said, "Yeah, it's not good. So you know, it's just learning. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> Let's talk for just a minute about Trikafta, not what it is or how it works. That's not what this is about. I want to talk a little bit more about what Trikafta has done. Uh, it, it's really done some amazing things, as a lot of folks are aware of. And now we have a population of kids that are even younger that can start using it. It's the lower dose. But uh, we have seen some market, market improvements in patients' lives in the short time that we have been uh, yes. um, working with this. And I mean, I'm talking PFT pulmonary function tests that have improved by 40 and 50% mm -hmm. in the forced vital capacity in the forced expiratory volume at one second. Uh, it's just astounding. And uh, their secretions, they, they a lot of times will go through a secretion. We call it a secretion storm. It lasts between seven to sometimes 15 days. and it's like all of this mucus, this one patient put it, he said, it's like everything I ever had in my lungs had to come up in a week, a week and a half. And then after that happens, they suddenly are clear. Now with that, they don't produce hardly at all. Their lungs are functioning like yours and mine for the most part. They start gaining weight. They start sleeping better. They start digesting better. We have women and getting pregnant. It's really nice. We have a couple little things that happen from time to time though. And I think that's like any, any drug, any medication or therapy, there is always a little something to kind of keep an eye on. Um, so one of the things with uh, Trikafta is it can cause uh, increased liver function, enzyme tests, 
it, it does increase your liver enzymes in some cases uh, fairly fairly high uh, and there are a few patients here and there but this is more adults now that uh, can gain some pretty significant weight and let's be honest they've been used to being told to eat everything but the kitchen sink to gain weight high protein high fat and uh, that's what you need to eat you, you know well that guess what your system's working more normally it's functioning you know, those, those mucus is not plugging everything up anymore. Your system's digesting like it should. So your body says, hey, we can gain weight. So we have some people that have gained weight. And it's an interesting thing. It's causing some patients some mental anxiety. They're suddenly saying, well, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. I didn't think I gained weight like this. And they'll stop taking it. And then we have to kind of give them some counseling that they can keep taking it, but we need to do some other things. This is what it brings me to. Make sure your patients that they're on Try captain. Make sure that you still have all your therapies, your devices, mm -hmm. your vest. You keep, keep if, if they stop using those because they're now doing other normal things, that's fantastic. But make sure that they have the ability to go back on that if something happens. Because we have had some patients that had to come off tri captain. And as you're probably well aware, for the most part, uh, that modulator goes away and the protein starts misbehaving again so to speak and suddenly you're having issues with your secretions getting thick again and starting to get plugged up in your airways so um, have that handy if you get into a situation where you have to come off of it and then the other thing i've been advising every one of my patients when i talk to them about this is if you're not doing these therapies anymore because you don't have to what are you replacing that and i really think it's a really great idea to replace it with exercise and there's some patients that they're not used to really doing exercise one there's some cf patients that couldn't really exercise very well um, so their exercise was the best devices lots of medications puff cough all these therapeutics and they stopped doing the therapeutics because, because they feel pretty good now but the one problem is they're deconditioned they're not exercising like they should. And if they should get into some problems where they have to come off track after, now they really don't have anything to fall back on. So I think it's really important uh, as parents to, if you have an older child or, or an adult, to let them know that, hey, this is wonderful. Let's, let's make sure we stay conditioned. And I mean, that's a simple thing for everybody, quite frankly. I mean, all of us should be you know, conditioned. But um, with the CF population, it's really important that they kind of keep the exercise up. Um, and that that's kind of about what I have. Um, and I can, we can send us slides to you. Sorry, I wasn't, we're IT challenged here, but we can uh, send the, what we have to you if you want to send them out. So sure, that'd be great. We'll, we'll, maybe we can, we can post them on our website and then I'll send out an email to everyone here. Yeah, and, and then, of course, I know a lot of you probably know about this, but, you know, the CF Foundation is an absolute fantastic resource mm -hmm. um, for a lot of, honestly, what we've been talking about. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I encourage people to go to the what type of websites that are proven. There are some things out there that are, you know, how Google is. Uh, it's, it's a great tool, but it can be uh, misinformative <laughs> if you get to looking at the wrong things. But that... CF Foundation is so committed to doing things mm -hmm. right. I, I love to be a part of it. So yes. I would encourage you to look at, that, at those. And as far as, you know, looking at devices, uh, you certainly can Google these devices and they have wonderful uh, presentations on their products mm -hmm. in, in much more detail than I have time to go into. So I would recommend that. I think that's yeah. I guess we, we can take some questions if we can try to help you answer. Yeah, I have, I have a question. Hi, this is Mike Rock. Um, one of the things you said, you said that um, using uh, sterile water uh, instead of distilled water is better because distilled water can cause besopatia. Um, can you just go into that a little bit further and just dis Yeah, I, I just, I need to look at a source. I was quoted that on... Um, on, uh, I'm on this list, sir, with the American Respiratory Care Society, and uh, that's what I was what I was um, told. 
So um, it, it's just sterile water is is safe. So um, is that we know only, that. Is that only when you use the bags or? or... No, it, it's it, it's mainly John. John has had more recent experience with it. I'm going to turn so it one, over to him. One, one of the the things that we found that they found, and I'll be honest with you, this was news to me. I've been doing this a long time, and I kind of went, "Well, I didn't know that." Uh, so, distilled water in the process of distilling can still you can still get some sapatia in that. Think about how much water is distilled, right? Yeah, so, you know. Yeah, I, I wasn't aware of that. And it's me either. I'll be honest with you. Up until just not that long ago, and I mm -hmm. kind of pulled myself back and went, "I didn't know that." Yeah. And I mean. so sterile water—that's all been taken out of there. There's no possible way for that to happen. So and, that's kind of why they're recommending using the sterile instead of distilled. And just one further, one follow-up question to that. You can buy sterile water, I assume, in any supermarket. You can buy sterile water, right? At any supermarket, oh, yeah. just as you can buy uh, distilled water, correct? Yeah. yeah, and you can make your own too. Like if you boil it for five minutes. I have that on um, the information that I'll put on, on the slide, okay? Okay, so. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. And um, one of the just side note, real quick, I just thought about it. If, if you do nasal rinsing, which a lot of CF patients do nasal rinsing because they have mm -hmm. sinus issues, again, um, because of the possibility for growth medium, make sure you're using sterile water if you sinus rinse. And that's yeah. something I've kind of known for a while. And if you're going to use a neti pot or that type mm -hmm. of thing where you're rolling it in, and it gets mm -hmm. up in your sinus. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's a good idea to make sure you use you know, sterile water for that as well. Okay, yeah, thank you. Yeah, this is from Timothy. I had a quick question. What was that purple device that you had there, the, the flutter thing that you were breathing through? What's the name of this, it? Uh, this is one that's kind of new to me. Um, and I'm going to kind of start pushing it a little bit. Uh, it's called a VibraPet. And uh, oh, what a Viber Viber up that it's by uh, let me get this real quick. Yeah, yeah, it's by a company called Kiraplex, and this again is kind of what it looks like. Yeah, and um, it's uh, it has a really nice manual in it that goes through all the instructions and how to use it, what you do with it. And the other nice thing about this is you, again, you can nebulize with this. So it works really well. I, I was, uh, I, I'm a big fan of the Aerobeak as well. I think that's a really great device. Mm -hmm. uh, I think this is personally feels like it's right up there with it though. Um, I love the ergonomics of this handle. Immediately when I started using it, I went, Ooh, I like the feel of this. And I honestly think it's kind of fun. Uh, I think, you know, one of the things that we don't think about sometimes when our patients have to do these therapies two, sometimes three times a day, if they're having an exacerbation, how much work that is. I mean, do a whole set of stuff on yourself sometimes and see what it's like. And every day, day in, day out, all the time. And so for compliance issues, um, it's good to make sure that the routine you get is one that you can kind of build so they know this is what we do but I think it sometimes can be a little fun for kids I mean I um, I would take something like this device for instance and I would personalize it this is the type of device that I would go and get some cool stickers and I would put these stickers all over it and this is this is yours okay so this is what's going to help you breathe and then have some fun with it you know Thinking the same thing. I, I mean, you, you know, you can hear the sound. I've had kids make noise about this sound, what it might be. <laughs> um, so, again, I think trying to make the therapy sometimes lighthearted can be helpful. Uh, but this particular device, I, I'm, it's, I'm kind of sold on this it's in a, a lot of ways. It's a fun one. Yeah. When I, when I fired it up here at work, everybody started laughing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and again, you know, it has all those different resistance on there. So you can use that as well. So, anyway, yeah, this is, I like this one. It's a good one. Do you have any other questions? I, I just have one other question uh, on the Perry e Rapid Nebulizer. Um, 
or remember you were saying how long can you use certain things and you can use a, a nebulizer for six months. Um, the Perry E rapid nebulizer, we used one for, for a couple of years and then we just bought another one. Um, do you have any, any data on how long you should use that? I don't. Okay. Um, basically, you know, my, it's basically like what I've been kind of put into my brain is, is the six month rotation. Um, now, am I right on that? I might be wrong on that. Okay. okay. So what I would do, you know, uh, is let's look that up, yeah. look your device up and, and let's double check it and see if they say to use it longer. Some devices you probably could use a little longer. I mean, I know, the, I know certainly the Alteras and some of those devices that are more permanent, those last a long, long time <laughs> because they use a, a different type of device. They use a type of piezoelectric type thing that basically shapes the water is what it does, it shakes the, the medication and it comes up as a mist. And uh, so that's why it has the moving the metal parts. In it. Okay, but, but uh, that's a good question. And I, I can't fully answer that, to be honest. Okay, all right, thanks. Someone had asked whether there would be a list of the devices available. And so I was, wasn't sure if that would be among your slides, but if that, if not, is that something that you'd be willing to put together or, I mean, without. We could. Yeah, yeah we, we could. could um, we could, we could put together some of that. Um, and again, I guess I, because of sake of time, I didn't have like four or five different devices. Mm -hmm. I, again, it would have been really cool to show you the differences. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we can easily put together a list and then you guys can go look that up and kind of decide what you might think works for you or what maybe doesn't work for you. It's, it's the consumer's choice, you know, but, and there's some facilities that are going to push one device over another. Um, you know, in this day and age, we're also very careful about corporate compliance, uh, I'll be honest with you. So we stay a little out of too much advertising potential. You know, if I had my way, I would just blow it all up, but we got to be somewhat generic. Um, that's just the way it works. It works that way. But we can certainly get a list for you. That would be no problem. Mm -hmm. can look it up. What else can I help you guys with? Oh, yeah. About international plugs and things. That's a tough one. That is a tough one. Yeah. yeah. Um, There are adapters out there that you can plug the device into, and then that adapter will plug into your different outlet, whatever that happens to be. You would have to look that up to find out which, how to do that, but there are things out there that you can do that. And, uh, cause that's, that's a fantastic, fantastic question because I mean, there's people that do travel internationally. Uh, and so, but yeah, the adapters, that's one to look into. And of course, everyone's going to be a bit different depending on what country you're in and what area uh, that uses that type of electrical outlet. Our older daughter used an adapter when she was traveling, but she just used it for the um, for charging the device. Mm -hmm. I think she had okay. um, for her nebulizer. She ended up being advised to get one with get one there that was had a, a plug. She was there for a lot. Well, I mean, it was for a study abroad, so she was there for an extended length of time. Yeah, mm -hmm. if you're going to be so, there for, you know, for a while, that's a, a very it's a good investment. Mm -hmm. You know, now if you're just going to go over and travel Europe for a vacation, that may just fit real nice in your suitcase and do a nice job for you and you can clean it and not, not worry about take transporting a big heavy vest. Although there's some people that would still want to probably, if they might think about taking their Aflo or Monarch, Monarch vest with them, but because uh, they're you know very portable, of course, they're mobile, but that would be up to the patient to just kind of decide. But if it's going to be for a shorter stay, I mean, I, you know, I still think some sort of therapeutic would be very good to have. But um, and like I said, I think some of these PEP devices are getting more and more, uh, they're working better. 
They really are. I can, when I put this one on, I could feel it way down in here, mm -hmm. which is, I was surprised. I went, whoa, I can really feel it. So um, I think that's a good news, you know, because we can have stuff that we take horrible. But anytime you're traveling, like you said, for an extended period, yeah, I think that's a really good. Um, as far as the Monarch for teens, um, their recommendation is that um, the patient be 15 plus. Um, and I think that's just based on probably the looking at the jacket size availability and the fact that it weighs around 13 pounds with the battery. Um, if the 13 patient is, you know, pretty good size 13 year old, then I would say, mm -hmm. give it a go um, and at least get a sizing and see if there's a sizing that would match. It's imperative to get the right jacket size with this thing. Those, those oscillating magnets in there, they have to be over the right places. If you get them off one way or the other, then it's going to start oscillating areas you don't want to oscillate. Uh, for instance, you wouldn't want to oscillate your rib cage. You know, that could really start feeling uncomfortable in a, in a hurry. So you want to make sure you get them to where they're in the right spots, lower lobes and upper lobes. Um, so that, that's probably partly why they're recommending that. Now, um, the Aflo vest, that's for, they say, unlimited age. Um, so Aflo for a 13 year old certainly is something that you could look into. And that, that, it weighs a lot less. It weighs eight and a half pounds for some of the bigger kids and adults. So, I mean, that, I mean, again, thinking about daily use for compliance, uh, having, having a device that weighs a lot more. And again, this is not just well, one or two treatments, but every day, all the time. That could sometimes get to a situation where you're going, eh, I don't want to use this today. And so, you know, that can get now into a situation where uh, it's been a week. I guess I better use it again, you know. So um, weight's important. I mean, I've put these jackets on and I was kind of surprised how heavy the Monarch was. I went, oh, wow, this isn't something that I go on a hike with. I mean, it's, you can feel it, you know. But um, I was really impressed with how it worked. Really impressed. So I wasn't really aware that you could um, nebulize medication through those devices. I don't think oh, I yeah. Some, yeah. Yeah. Some you can. Yeah. Um, I probably, you know, there's some medications that are a little more sticky than you know, like some of the antibiotics mm -hmm. out there mm -hmm. that can gum things up a little. So it might be a little cautious about putting antibiotics through this type of device. Mm -hmm. uh, but your, your inhaled um, bronchodilators. Mm -hmm. Uh, certainly your uh, Plomazyme, Plomacort is an inhalated inhalation therapy that some people use. Um, those are all fine. Uh, and again, the, the hypersal is completely fine. But again, I, you, you're wanting to get that rinsed really nicely because that salt can kind of get in there and condense. And then the device will start not working quite as well. But um, yeah, you can do that. It, it comes with the ability to do it. That's what's so cool about it. And the, the perineps, for instance, um, those things will just fit right on. Just boom, you're right on there. Um, that's where this device um, maybe is not quite as good because it's a great device, but you can see it'd be hard to adapt. Um, but, and then other one letter tiny thing, um, I, I failed to mention this, but there are some patients that we use a mask with that are little. You know, I, I've been in the adult world now for a while. I forget our little guys sometimes. If you're gonna use one of those like Perry masks or something like that, perfectly fine. They work great. Again, let's use the, uh, the, uh, the sterile water to, to clean those out, your soap, and get them good. Uh, don't, don't boil them too hot. Those mm -hmm. things will start to get disshapen mm -hmm. on you real quick. Yes. And I don't think I would put probably put those mass parts in a Medela bag. I think you would also face the same problem of them getting kind of- They're softer. They're, they are softer yeah. Yeah. rubber, and uh, yeah. I think plastic. And I think they mm -hmm. can get disshapen pretty quick. And as you're aware, you want to have a good seal. And you're going to mm -hmm. do those kind of things. So, I'm sorry I didn't bring that up earlier, but I'm going to remember that. Um, like I said, I could do this for another 45 minutes, yeah. you know, but um, for the sake of time. But um, I'm trying to think, is there anything? Any other questions?
Thank you very much. Yeah, if you can get me, if you can email me the slides, I'll be happy to post them. Okay. And um, if, if there aren't any other questions, I have a few closing polling questions for the, the parents, but does anyone else have a question before I start the poll? Some really excellent tips and information. Yeah, thank you all. Yeah, thank you very thank much. You very much. Useful. Thank you. It's, it's been a pleasure to, yeah. to be able to speak to you folks. And, uh, yeah. you know, hey, good luck with everything. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm, you know every, day's a, every day's a gift. So enjoy it. Yeah.